more normal, I must say, for myself doing this kind of work. And I propose to take you on a virtual tour of Belfast, assisted from time to time by some photographs and images, which I think I can show you. But I want to bring you right back to the origins of Belfast, because it's a city which is not only the capital of Northern Ireland, the industrial capital of Ireland, from the 19th century on, but a city that has shaped Irish history and indeed British imperial history um, in so many ways. So um, you all know Belfast, but just to remind you of the kind of town we're talking about, hopefully I've got it here. This is the high street in Belfast about 1780. The image of course by an English artist called John Nixon. And uh, basically in the distance, you can see what's now St. George's Church was then the Chapel of the Ford in 1780. And of course, there are masted ships where the River Farset, on which Belfast was built, enters Belfast Lock. And there you have a range of houses. And um, I suppose on the left, as we look at the photograph, a flag flying from it, you have the old market house, the market house, which we would see an important public hanging among many at the end of the 18th century. So that's the Belfast we're talking about. And we're going to start really at St. George's Church. You probably know these pillars, very historic pillars beside the Albert Memorial, the Albert clock, but we're going to start there because this is the site of one of Belfast's oldest kind of Christian, if you like, um, ecclesiastical sites uh, in the town because this was the chapel of the Ford from the 13th, 14th century on the Middle Ages at the end of High Street. And of course, we bring in the place names. The word Belfast, Belfastia, means the mouth of the Farset River, one of the many fast flowing streams coursing down from the scarp of the Belfast Mountains, coming down the Shankill, the Falls Road. The Farset enters Belfast at Millfield. And of course, historically, it turned the, the wheels of the cotton mills and then the linen mills along its road. Though it's almost completely underground today. It flows up the centre of High Street, hidden from the human eye, and enters Belfast Lock, just about St George's Church. And of course, way back in the 18th century, um, the, uh, there were docks on either side of High Street there at St George's Church. The river was navigable until then. The problem was, of course, that Belfast didn't have a, a deep seafaring port until the 1849 cut, when a cut was made through the sludge, which became the Victoria Channel and Belfast became accessible to major ocean going shipping and became, of course, a decade after that, a shipyard. But let's get, let's get back to this early period. The mouth of the Farset River, Belfast was a very rural place, really down to fairly modern times. The historian of Belfast, George Benn, who wrote a history at 1823 and a larger history 50 years later, writes in his first sentence, Belfast as a town has no ancient history. And of course, he's comparing Belfast or Belfast, as people used to call it, with Dublin, with London, with Derry, stroke London Derry, which in many ways has a much richer history. Derry has that pre-plantation history. Derry Column Kill, the Oak Grove of St. Column Kill, the ancient monastery at Long Tower. Belfast slightly different. It really is a plantation town which takes its roots in the early 1600s with the plantation of Ulster. So in that respect, it's rather like Oma or Enniskillen during that period. But even before the plantation, there was something at Belfast because, as you know, about 1177, a Norman knight called John de Courcy spied from the Pale, the area around Dublin, this area around Belfast Lock, modern Antrim and Down. And he led a small army, a one-man expedition in 1177, through the gap of the north at Newry, he conquered Don Patrick, and he established eventually what became known as the Earldom of Ulster, run by the Normans, who were the shock troops of Europe in the Middle Ages, with their light suits of armour, their, their, their crossbows. They, of course, had established Dublin as a great trading port, uh, building the castle there in the kind of um, uh, 12th century. And now John de Courcy came to Belfast, and as well as Carrickfergus Castle and Dundrum Castle, he established Belfast Castle. And you had the Norman manor of Belfast, and the Normans became the dominant, if you like, um, aristocracy in the area. They were the ascendancy. They subordinated the 
old Gaelic clans with names like O'Neill and uh, the Magaris and all of those names in the greater Belfast area. Remember, this is sort of 500 years almost before the plantation. But the Normans made a fatal mistake. They had a civil war among themselves in 1333. And the Earl of Ulster was assassinated just outside Belfast. In fact, they have a place name called Skegenil, which means Skegenala, which is the um, it's the kind of the tree of the arrow. And we believe that the Earl of Ulster um, was actually assassinated there in 11, 1333 by a fellow Norman. And a civil war broke out among the Normans. Their fortresses, their manors, their granaries were destroyed. And this created a vacancy. And I'm talking to a Tyrone audience, you know what I mean. A branch of the O'Neills of Chiron, of Tyrone, moved into eastern Ulster. And they became the O'Neills of Clan de Boy, Clan e Bui, the clan of Hugh of the, the Yellow Hair. And remember today, on, <laughs> um, unusually, in the Clan de Boy shopping centre um, to the east of the city. But the Clan de Boy O'Neills took uh, over the old Norman castle in what's now High Street, uh, on that ancient street as it became, and they built a castle at Cashlan Rhea, Castle Ray in the Belfast Hills, from which they had a, a bird's eye view of Belfast Lock and the approaching enemy. And the O'Neills are here until the plantation. Um, and indeed, they are the last Gaelic clan who actually, whose lands are divided up um, with the two Scottish settlers um, at the end of the 16th beginning of the 17th century and Belfast becomes a plantation town we still have the Mots and Baileys um, along the River Lagan we have Carrick Fergus Castle which meant that Carrick Fergus was a much more important town than Belfast until about 1750 it was the county town of Antrim but Belfast begins to overtake it the story of Belfast that town we looked at let's have a look again at the high street this is Arthur Chichester's town Arthur Chichester, a ruthless military commander under Elizabeth, was one of the men who conquered Ulster, who toured Loch Ney, who defeated O'Neill, and of course he established himself in a number of roles. He was from the south of England, he was an adventurer, a kind of almost a, a mercenary type, who became indispensable to Elizabeth in her conquest of Ireland. And of course he became governor of Carrickfergus, Lord Deputy of Ireland at this critical period uh, around the time of the flight of the Earls. And of course, he established the town of Belfast. It got a royal charter in 1613, and it was a mainly Scottish town. You know yourselves that the plantation was overwhelmingly Scots. Um, landless sons from the lowlands of Scotland pouring into Eastern Ulster, and then beginning to fan out uh, their influence more or less ebbing and flowing but becoming weaker as you went west across the river ban but very strong in antrim and on so we have a town here by 1610 1613 with a royal charter and very much a scottish accent um that scottish burr rather like probably ballymena uh, broad scots as they would say lingered on in the growing town of Belfast until after the Great Famine, when the accent changed because a new group of people were migrating uh, from the from rural Ulster into Linenopolis as Belfast had become. So let's have a think about this town. Chichester in command, um, he was determined to extend the Reformed faith. He was at loggerheads with the uh, Macdonalds of the Glens, um, a Scottish family who had settled there in the Middle Ages and had become Catholic, but were friendly with James II, the new king, who allowed the Earl of Antrim, Randall Macdonald, to take charge of the plantation, Catholic though he was. Chichester didn't like any of this. However, um, he dies in 1625. He's buried in Carrick Fergus, of which he was governor. And Belfast is really just one street, the high street. We've just looked at it. Um, behind it, you had a street called Back Street, which became known as Anne Street later. And this is the town where rich and poor lived cheek by jowl, which is the town, that line, um, High Street, Bridge Street, which includes, of course, the Northern Whig. You probably know that, the former um, 
liberal newspaper. And then, of course, you have the, the old assembly rooms there from the 1760s, 1770s. Now an historic building mouldering away in an area that has been imaginatively named Tribeca. Uh, after a, a street uh, area of New York. Uh, the mind does boggle a bit, but I'll keep going. In any event, Belfast begins to grow in this period. It's a fairly insignificant part town. One Lord Deputy called it a barbarous nook in the northeast corner of Ireland. Um, but it's a town that is aware of its own connections. And as the Irish Parliament, I mean, it's important in the 17th century. Um, first of all, if I can find the map, it is not quite a walled city like Derry, but it is a ramparted town. There is an earthen rampart thrown around the town in the 1640s to protect it, particularly uh, at the time of the 1641 rebellion. There are three gates. One of them you probably have passed by many times was known as the Mill Gate in Castle Street, the adjoining Chapel Lane there, an old part of the town near the Castle Court shopping centre. Um, but there were three gates into the town and Cromwell's army was held at bay for a few days in 1649, um, led uh, by Colonel Venables before they eventually took the town. And they turned St George's Church, um, which was the chapel of the Ford, wasn't quite the modern building. They turned that into a barracks. And after that, St George's gave way to a new church, which was built in 1775. It was called St Anne's on the site of the present St Anne's Cathedral. Of course, Belfast survived Cromwell. Uh, it survived the 1641 rebellion when the rebel army came within a mile or two of the town, burning um, the hill fortress at Malone, now Malone House, if you know, a place you can get a cup of coffee there beside Shaw's Bridge. And, but they never actually got into Belfast because you had this stalwart um, defensive force of lowland Scots in the town who relied on their own resources. They had a rather strained relationship with the landlord who become the Donegal family. Because Chichester was given land in Inishon and County Donegal, County Antrim and Belfast, his family took their title from Donegal and they became the Earls of Donegal. So the centre of the town is replete with Donegal Place, Donegal Street, Donegal Pass. You know all that, spelled with two L's down to this day. Um, Belfast, of course, welcomed King Billy. Um, it was a royalist town always. And in 1690, King William arrived at Carrickfergus and made his way into Belfast, where he, had, he, he attended on his last Sunday in the town before proceeding to the Boyne. Uh, William of Orange, William Prince of Orange, now crowned King of Great Britain and Ireland and um, charged with evicting the Catholic King James, who had invaded Ireland at Kinsale and was making his way northwards, he was determined to defeat King James. And he would do so, of course, at the Battle of the Boyne. And he attended divine service in the church that stood on this side, the uh, Chapel of the Ford, in um, uh, June 1690, uh, and proceeded southwards. And we know William's victory at the Boyne changed the course of Irish history. It not only secured um, Britain and Ireland under Protestant rule, but it gave the landed gentry, who were known as the Anglican ascendancy, reign over Ireland. They formed the new Irish Parliament in Dublin. They passed the penal laws. Anybody who's been to any of my talks in Oma will know I, I let a lot about the penal laws. But the thing to remember about the penal laws is Anglicanism, the Church of Ireland, was the state church. It was the, start of the church of the Donegals and the Abercorns and the Charlemonts and the landed gentry of Ireland. Um, the Presbyterians, who had been allies at the Boyne, were, if you like, second-class citizens under the penal laws. Their marriages weren't recognised. They couldn't attend Trinity College. They couldn't even hold, for much of this period, um, public appointments in the civil service. But of course, the Catholic masses, 80% of the population, they were the third class citizens, excluded from land, power, education, political patronage. But some of them, enterprising Catholics in ports like Waterford and Galway, found ways around that. They went into the wine trade. They began to open taverns. And of course, in that long 18th century, the penal laws began to break down because a party grew up as peace, if you like, began to reign more supreme by the 1750s in the Irish Parliament, uh, led by, uh, known as the Patriot Party. 
including men like Henry Grattan, whose grandfather had been a Church of Ireland rector in County Tyrone, Henry Flood, both lawyers, the Earl of Charlemont from the Moy, a County Tyrone landlord, and they began, and outside to people like Jonathan Swift, the literary dean of St. Patrick's, they began to see themselves as the Irish nation. They'd been in Ireland now for a century and a half. And they saw themselves a bit like the French in Algeria in the 1950s as really the, the people of Ireland, the ruling class. And they began to demand rights. And this had an impact on Ulster Presbyterians who had been excluded from some full civil rights as well. In this period, the penal laws eventually begin to ease and a better feeling develops in the country between Catholic, Protestant and dissenter, those people who belong to the Lowland Scots Presbyterian tradition. One thing we have to remember about the Presbyterians of Belfast and Tyrone and the Lagan in East Donegal was that they had a very high regard for education. They had an educated clergy, but they couldn't avail of the Church of Ireland College Trinity, which went back to 1592. So they sent their clergymen, their, um, if you like, trainee lawyers and doctors to the universities of um, Glasgow and Edinburgh. And this produced a kind of a Presbyterian intelligentsia across the north of Ireland, but especially in Belfast, where you had a radicalised group of people who had come into touch with radical political thought in Scotland. Now, of course, Belfast begins to grow. By 1760, it is linked to Dublin by a stagecoach. It takes two days to get here. But puts it in the mainstream. It's represented in the Irish Parliament by two MPs, but they're very much in the pocket of the Donegal family. They speak to the landed interest. The Presbyterians find that they are precluded from influence and power, despite the fact that they're running tanneries in the town. There's a great uh, uh, trade with the um, West Indies, with the Caribbean, where many enterprising merchants by the 1760s and 70s have sugar plantations. And that becomes an issue because these sugar plantations are fueling Belfast with finance, but they're also driving the local economy. By the 1760s, 1770s, we have something like 250 shoemakers in Belfast, self-employed, who are making broad fitting shoes for the black slave laborers of these sugar plantations. And of course, this becomes a human rights issue in the age of the Enlightenment as well. Belfast has tanneries. Um, by the 1790s, it has a ship repair yard. It only builds one ship in 1792 called the Hibernia, which means Ireland. But it lays the foundations for the much later and much more lucrative Victorian shipbuilding industry. By 1750, population of the town, 15,000, maybe five or 600 Catholics who are beginning to come into the town but as the historian George Benn puts it, are socially of no account. This is a Presbyterian town, but there's a strain between Lord Donegal and his unruly Presbyterian tenantry uh, in the town of Belfast. But Belfast is soon to become impacted, as the whole of Ireland is, by two great events. And since I have a Tyrone audience, you know all those cottages to the ancestors of American presidents, Ulysses Grants and all the rest, and the Straban connection with the American War of Independence, where Straban-born John Dunlap went to the colonies in search of a better life. And he famously printed in 1776 the American Declaration of Independence. The key to this is that because of the penal laws, because of harsh land laws, because of evictions which undermined the Ulster custom in the north of Ireland, something like 200,000 Ulster Presbyterians from Antrim to Tyrone and Donegal had found their homes in the American colonies, in New York, in Philadelphia, in Tennessee, during that long 18th century. And they would become, of course, George Washington's army, or a large part of it in the American War of Independence. And so the hearts and minds of Belfast Presbyterians and those across Ulster was very much in harmony with their separated brethren in what was soon to become the United States. The American War of Independence radicalized Belfast, but it did something else. Um, a ship sailed into Belfast Lock in 1778. This was one of the most far-flung American naval engagements. A privateer, kind of a pirate, 
uh, under the new American flag called John, John Paul Jones, sailed into Belfast Lock and attacked a royal naval ship off Carrickfergus. The sovereign of Belfast, who was the mayor and his corporation, were horrified as they watched this naval encounter from a distance. And on that very day, in April 1778, a dad's army was formed called the Volunteers. These were Presbyterian middle-class men armed in sync with the law, uniform. They began to patrol the shores of Ulster. They spread across Ireland. They were soon an armed force and they were now officered by the gentry, the Abercorns, you know, the Noxes of Derry, the, um, the um, uh, 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 Charlemans of the Moy. And they were determined to uh, defend Ireland from invasion by the, the Catholic um, French. But of course, Ireland wasn't invaded by the French. The Americans won their war for independence and the volunteers turned their attention to Irish politics. They had arms and they showed they were prepared to use them. By 1778, they demanded free trade for Ireland, pointing a cannon at the great Irish Parliament in Dublin. This was the age when King Billy's statue stood outside the Bank of Ireland, Trinity College. It stood there to 1929, but that's another story. And each year on King William's birthday, I think I'm the last person to remember it, I raise a pint to King William, every 4th of November, ha, huh? you thought it was the 12th of July. And um, they gathered round King William's statue. But in 1778, the episode was marred when the Dublin volunteers turned a cannon towards the Parliament building and it bore uh, an inscription, free trade, uh, or this. I hope I didn't drive that lady from the meeting. In any event, the key thing was that the British government granted Ireland free trade. No longer could the English Parliament legislate for Ireland and damage the Irish wool trade, the Irish beer trade. And now Belfast and Derry were, if you like, free trading ports within the uh, British Empire in its infancy. But of course, they didn't achieve all they wanted. The volunteers were strongest in the north, in places like Belfast, Newtonards, Oma, Castle Derg, where they had been parading, and, if you like, um, demonstrating their prowess at arms training. And so they began to demand more than this. They wanted the easing of the penal laws against their Catholic fellow countrymen. From 1775 on, the penal laws were eased. Catholics could open schools, could become lawyers, could, um, if you like, um, um, uh, own land, uh, could bear arms, could join the British army, which needed them, um, and so on. So the penal laws began to ease, thanks largely to these radical volunteers in Belfast. But of course, another revolution is on the cards. Belfast is impacted from 1789 on by the French Revolution. And as Wolfe Tone wrote in his diary, speaking about the whole of Ireland, but especially the North, which he had a special attachment to, Wolfe Tone, Protestant, Dublin lawyer, radical reformer, with a private vision of an independent Ireland, he wrote about the French Revolution. This gigantic event changed in an instant the politics of Ireland. So suddenly, you know, liberty trees were being planted in fields in Tyrone and Antrim. Several are still there today, relics of the radical 1790s. And soon, of course, in Belfast, you have this radical hub of merchants, of lawyers, overwhelmingly Presbyterians, who feel that the only way to achieve real change in Ireland, to reform Parliament, to end corruption, to extend the franchise, is to link up with the Catholic majority in Ireland and on an October evening in 1791, a lawyer gets on a coach at Dublin. He was the son of a middle class Dublin coach builder who built beautiful coaches and fours for the politicians of the Irish Parliament. His name was Theobald Wolfton. He hadn't been a very successful lawyer, but he was the secretary to the middle class Catholic committee, which was um, imploring the king to ease the harsh penal laws against the Catholics of Ireland and who were proclaiming their loyalty to the Crown. Tone came north and that night in the Crown Tavern and Crown Entry, one of the many little lanes off the high street that we've looked at, Wolf Tone, of course, um, in uh, Crown Entry, 
met his Belfast Presbyterian counterparts. And people like Samuel Nielsen, a wealthy linen um, draper, a son of a Presbyterian minister, Henry John McCracken from the most eminent trading family in the town, ardent Presbyterians, um, and of course, uh, people like Thomas McCabe, Presbyterian shopkeeper, they form the Society of United Irishmen on the 14th of October, 1791. Their aim, they said, was to unite Catholic, Protestant and dissenter in the common name of Irishmen. They were going to draw a line over a very bloody past in which atrocities had been committed in all sides, from the Nine Years' War to the Plantation, to the Catholic Rising of 1641, to Cromwell at Drogheda. That was an awful lot of, uh, of history to be overcome. But they had this vision and they wanted a reform of the Irish Parliament. And they said that everyone must be included members of every religious persuasion. Almost immediately, branches of the Society of United Irishmen sprang up from Belfast to Ballyclare to Samefield, to the Moy, uh, to Ochnacloy, to Castledown. You had this nexus on the borders of Tyrone and Donegal where the men of the Down in the 1790s, shifting with the United Irishmen from constitutional means by the mid 1790s to physical force would meet one night in the Presbyterian meeting house and the next night in the chapel at Ayan. It's an amazing period and that liberal kind of um, movement in North Tyrone would survive right down to the 20th century when North Tyrone would have something like 300 Presbyterian farmers who would always vote home rule and it became the bailiwick of a liberal home rule candidate down to 1918. Um, it shows you how the impact of the Troubles and all that has changed that old historical memory in a place like Castle Derg. But it was in Belfast that these foundations were led down. Tone became a regular visitor. Belfast became a town, in the words of one Lord Lieutenant, that no king could govern and no law, no God could please. It was the radical nexus, punching above its weight. And of course, it becomes after 1793, 94, when reform is not achieved, the most Republican town in Ireland. But its leaders are Presbyterians. Not all of them, but many of these intellectuals who would meet in the coffee houses of the town, coffee drinking was a big thing then, as now, except you talked politics over coffee. We only do that in the Tower Centre um, in winter evenings. Um, but also, of course, it was a place where you had the Presbyterian meeting houses, three of them in Rosemary Street al alone. And one son of one of those meeting houses was a Dublin-based doctor. His name was Dr. William Drennan. And Drennan, of course, was the son of a Presbyterian minister. We'll have a look at him here. Dr. William Drennan, there he is, born in Rosemary Street in 1754, educated in Scotland, a radical, um, a poet, uh, a surgeon, um, who founded the Dublin Society of the United Irishmen, where Catholic and Protestant and dissenter were conjoined in this era. He was also thinking that tone of an independent Ireland. And in this period, Belfast, of course, is a major cultural centre. The United Irishmen launch a cultural renaissance in the 1790s. They also, by the way, and I should say this is very important, they built the first Roman Catholic church at the end of the penal days in 1784. And here you have the Belfast Presbyterians marching to the first man in Old St Mary's and Chapel Lane. It's a summer's day in May 1784. The Catholic priest who had worshipped on the hillsides of Antrim in the penal days, who had attended mass stations in the hills above Belfast, he thanked them and said that their friendship and their generosity was a mark of regard which should never be effaced, which should never be forgotten. This is Belfast's almost forgotten golden age of the 1780s and 90s, when it was a town of cultural renaissance, cross-community harmony, radical politics. Remembered now happily since the peace process in a series of blue plaques among the high street. But I have to say, when I was discovering this through 
uh, in my in my teens and early twenties, at the height of the troubles, you had to strain as uh, you went down those lanes in High Street, and you had to kind of shake yourself to think that this was a different town where Presbyterians and Catholics were friends in an overwhelmingly Presbyterian town. But that's the milieu of the 1780s. And it was in the old assembly rooms, um, uh, which were built by Lord Donegal, that a meeting took place in 1786. There was a proposal to make Belfast a slaving port. Belfast would get involved in the lucrative slave trade. It would, if you like, kidnap slaves and ships from West Africa, Sierra Leone and uh, Nigeria. It would bring them to the sugar plantations of the West Indies or the southern parts of what became the United States, sell them into slavery and bring back cargoes of rum and tobacco and sugar. Against that stood one man, Thomas McCabe, a Presbyterian shopkeeper. He attended a famous meeting in 1786 and as Captain Waddell Cunningham of the Irish Volunteers, the wealthiest businessman in the town, the man who had led the volunteers to St Mary's Chapel. So he was a he was a, a very tolerant man in religious terms, but he proposed a slave ship company. McCabe wrote in the book of proposals, may God wither the hand of the man who would make such a nefarious suggestion. The businessman slunk away. The slave company never happened. But Belfast still benefited from the slave trade. Still, a radical step had been taken. And in that same building on, uh, in 1792, um, the local radicals, I'll show you the building, it's now under threat. This is the assembly rooms opposite the Northern Whig, but we sometimes call in Belfast the Four Corners. Uh, Waring Street, Donegal Street, North Street. It was in that upper story that the Harp Festival of July 1792 was held when the Presbyterians, assisted by Dr. James MacDonald, a native Irish speaker from the Glens, a member of the Church of Ireland, they invited harpers from each of the four provinces and they plied their wares there on the 11th and 12th of July. Wolf Tone attended. He had a sore head from a drinking spree the night before because he had a diary. The harpers again strum, strum and behind. But a man called Edward Bunting, the organist of St Anne's Church and a native of Armagh, he recorded the harp airs as played. She ve she more, the colon. He published three volumes later on. And as my friend Tom Sweeney will know, this is how we have the harp music of ancient Ireland um, preserved to this day. So this was the Radical Town, which had a radical newspaper called the Northern Star. Um, uh, its motto was, up off the harp, it is new, strong and shall be heard. Of course, all of this liberalism and radicalism, Pres Presbyterian interest in the Irish language, would be washed away in the bloodshed of the 1798 rebellion. When Henry John McCracken, one of the members of the McCracken family who had offered um, cultural support to Bunting in his musical endeavours. Henry John McCracken, the manager of a cotton mill on the falls, probably somewhere about Castle Street, Divis Street, a leading member of the United Irishmen, a handsome young man aged 30. McCracken, of course, would lead the United Irishmen at the Battle of Antrim in June 1798. They would be defeated. The battle could have gone either way. Um, his fellow Presbyterians would be defeated at the Battle of Ballina Hinch a few days later. McCracken went on the run, was captured, and was brought to be tried in the same assembly rooms, the trial of Henry John McCracken in July 1798. He was sentenced to death, allowing his uh, beloved sister Mary Ann, who died at age 96 and lived to be photographed. And Mary Ann McCracken, of course, would weep by her brother's scaffold in 1798, went on to rear Henry John McCracken's love child as her own, would go on to become a major worker uh, for the poor in the old poorhouse in Clifton Street, one of the great 18th century buildings still with us to this day. Um, and indeed, we can see uh, that beautiful Georgian building from 1774 in the picture. It's at the top of Donegal Street. Um, and of course, it was there that 
Mary Ann McCracken, um, worked for the education of the poor, campaigned against slavery. And she was one of the last, I suppose, receptors of that radical spirit of the 1790s. But of course, Belfast continues to grow. After the Act of Union of 1800, it becomes a very different time. The radical spirit begins to dwindle, snuffed out in sectarian bloodletting in the 1830s and 40s. Belfast begins, of course, to develop under the Act of Union as a very different time. Catholic emancipation is granted in 1829, and Belfast, having been a cotton town where you had cotton factories, um, begins to become a linen town for the 1830s as linen moves from the cottages of rural Ulster into Belfast and Banbridge and Oma and Sion Mills and becomes a factory based industry thanks to the wet spinning process. Now, Belfast becomes the international city of linen by the 1850s, Linenopolis. And while the famine devastates Ireland as a whole and inflicts massive damage on Belfast, where 2,000 people lie in the famine pits of Friars Bush. Nonetheless, Belfast emerges from the Great Famine as a major industrial centre. You not only have linen as part of a great tripod, you have shipbuilding. Harland and Wolfe emerging in the 1860s after that cut through the sludge of Belfast Lock, um, capable of building and receiving ocean-going ships, and then, of course, engineering. Belfast, by the mid nineteenth, late 19th century, had the biggest everything in the world, the biggest shipbuilding yard in the world, thanks to the partnership of Harland and Wolfe. Belfast people talked about Harland and Wolves. It sounded very frightening. But Gustav Wolf was a, a German industrialist from Hamburg who joined with a North of England businessman called Sir Edward Harland. And they took in a local guy, uh, a man called William Lord Perry. And Perry, of course, uh, envisioned the idea of ocean going liners built in Belfast and connecting Europe with the United States. And that becomes Belfast, if you like, a lifeline for the next 50 years. And I don't have to add, Belfast built Titanic. It sank, but many of the other ships, the Olympic and others, of course, survived. By 1914, the First World War, Belfast was the biggest shipyard in the world, employing 30,000 people. It had other industries, the biggest rope works in the world, the biggest flax spinning company in the world in York Street. Um, it had a glass works. Um, it had all sorts of factories, Belfast and the Lagan Valley. And of course, as Belfast grew, it drew people in from the countryside. That accent changing by the middle of the 19th century. The Catholic population coming from counties far away like Cavan and Monaghan and from Manor and um, Tyrone pouring into the town. They were about a third of the population by the 1861 census. And it looked as though Belfast might follow the former imperial capital Dublin and transform itself from being a Protestant city to a Catholic city. But that stops in the 1860s because Belfast becomes mired in sectarian divisions, in sectarian rioting. Very quickly, you have the modern demarcations, the falls, the old Catholic area um, close to the mountains becomes the main Catholic base with outliers like Ardoyne, um, where, for example, a, mill, a couple of mills close in County Cork in the turn of the 20th century. And the mill owners give the people a choice. They can go on the dole or go to America or they can go to their Belfast factories. And you have this migration to Ardoy. Different kind of people from the Catholics of other parts of Belfast. Um, you have Ballymacarrot in the shadow of the shipyards, a small Catholic area where people come from Munster in the far south, but also from South Down in particular. You have the markets. Then you have Sandy Row, um, the old Protestant area beside the Saltwater Bridge, renamed the Boyne Bridge, over which William had passed on his way to the Boyne. You have the Shankill, where the oldest Catholic church in the area, the Shankill, the old church, still lay in ruins until the early 20th century. You have the great shipbuilding area of Ballymacarrot. This is largely a Presbyterian town. And of course, 
Non-conformists, the Presbyterians, they are very much the skilled workers in the town. They are the shipwrights, the red letters, the new electricians. And they are that aristocracy of labour that's making a name for itself in industrial Britain, where it's drawn from the same stratum, the Congregationalists, the Scots Presbyterians, the Methodists. So Belfast becomes a divided town because at this period, Irish politics are being polarised. It's a question of home rule versus the union. There are some Protestant home rulers, but they're a very small minority. Belfast is remembered more for cross-class opposition to home rule. The real reason for their opposition, I suppose it was twofold. You had a fear that a Catholic parliament in Dublin, Daniel O'Connell had achieved the right of Catholics to vote and sit in parliament, would lord over the Protestant North and would treat them as the old descendancy in the 18th century had treated the Catholics of Ireland. But there was a second reason, a fear that an Irish parliament lacking economic and industrial experience would result in catastrophe for uh, Ireland's industrial northeast, that somehow linen and shipbuilding would go to the wall under home rule. Because Belfast by the 1880s, early 20th century, was hardwired to that great free trade area. No, I don't mean the European uh, Union, I mean the British Empire. Belfast linen and ships and lemonade. It became the lemonade capital of the British Empire, the only city of the empire to make brown lemonade, exported to Africa, to India, to Canada, to Australia. You could see, as Henry Cook said, look at the masted grove of, of ships. Henry Cook, um, Presbyterian minister, um, a, a major exponent of Unionism. Look what he said in the 1840s. Look at its masted grove of ships. Look at its great industry and be a home ruler if you may. This is the city that builds the city hall um, as the new epicenter on the site of the old white linen hall in um, 1906. So Belfast now um, has a large Protestant Unionist majority. This is in the age of home rule. It has a Catholic minority of 25%. Um, and of course, it is determined to remain outside a nationalist of governing Ireland in Dublin. Those riots, of course, uh, they curb the Catholic immigration into Belfast. You have riots in 1857, 1864, 1886, um, 1912, but the worst violence will come, overlapping partition, 1920 to 22, when almost 500 people die violently in sectarian and political violence in Belfast. So Belfast's history, when we look back, I suppose it confirms what has been said about the history of Ireland, a phrase I use a lot about the decade of centenaries. Um, it, in this island, we have a common history, but not a common memory. But I find increasingly, as we look at the decade of centenaries, but we go further back to the tap roots, roots of modern ideology, whether loyalism or orangeism or republicanism or nationalism or anti-slavery or pro-slavery, we're going back to that 18th century time with all this radicalism, um, which was kind of buried under the kind of Victorian streetscape and industrial overstructure of that period is a city where the overwhelming majority of streets, I was just saying in a broadcast this morning, are statues, are drawn from one tradition, the royalist, unionist, British militarist tradition. Um, and yet you have all of these other figures now remembered in blue, blue um, uh, plaques, the Mary Ann McCracken. She has two statues now in, in, the, in, the, in the city hall and in the poorhouse where she spent her life working uh, for the down uh, trodden of this society. But they are being remembered too. So it's an amazing city because in terms of the 20th century, shipbuilding, the Ulster Covenant, um, and so on, the um, uh, 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 capital of the new sub-state of Northern Ireland, uh, which counties like Fermanagh and Tyrone, at least their nationalist majorities, wanted to break away from. But Belfast has influenced us all in terms of its history. And it grew from that small town of 20,000 people in 1790 to perhaps 100,000 in the 1860s to 350,000 in 1900. And one, it's often said it was the fastest growing city in Ireland or Great Britain at that time. 
and of course a major industrial city, now a post-industrial town and indeed something that we are having to come to terms with and something that's causing problems in the peace process, problems for communities where you're now into third or fourth generation unemployment in areas where you had skilled labour, um, if you like, supplying shipbuilding and engineering for so long. One final quote, many things have been said about Belfast. One Victorian traveller came here and said, it was like a city that had uh, a pound in its pocket and roast beef for dinner. One bishop, um, Bishop William Philbin, who wasn't noticed for his poetry, he was a, a Roman Catholic bishop of the 1960s, 70s, and a theologian. But he said uh, in a short poem, Belfast is a city rimmed by hills, beautiful location, rimmed by hills and moated by sea, but undermined by history. Thank you very much. So I'm happy enough for uh, Tommy or someone to take charge and maybe ask you if there are any questions. And if you have any questions, I'd be delighted to answer them. Um, I see a face. Andy, nice to see a human face. I can't hear you. I can just see you. I see Audrey. Nice to see you. I can't, can't hear anybody. So I'm not quite sure it's a problem or should I be talking or... Can you hear me, Eamon? I can hear you now, Charlie. Thank you very much. Uh, Pastor Ron. We question um, to all the participants, is it okay, or is anybody any objections to um, Damien taking photographs of you during your question time? So just to put it up, makes me a bit more live with people on it. Or if anybody... I, has... I, 